Jason Redmond. He is a retired Navy SEAL who was wounded while deployed in Iraq in 2007. He's also the founder of the Combat Wounded Coalition, a nonprofit dedicated to inspiring combat wounded veterans. Everybody in life at some point is going to walk into an ambush, some sort of catastrophic event that's going to rock your world and have this impact on your life. The majority of people who walk this earth have never wrestled with an enemy combatant in the deep blackness of night. I was engaging the enemy and then suddenly my thinking was very cloudy. And I remember in that moment like reaching up to my face, the face that I had known was gone. All I felt was this hole. In the ensuing 35 minute firefight, I, along with two other members of my team, were severely wounded. Since that night, I know that I was granted a second chance. That day became a benchmark for me. It changed everything in my life. And I saw these young kids coming in and it made me recognize that I didn't have time to feel sorry for myself because I could lead right from that hospital bed. Regardless of the overwhelming odds or opposition in your path, you always have the opportunity to overcome. And I said, okay, let's drive forward. We can do this. I realized the mark of a man is not found in his past, but how he overcomes adversity and builds his future. Any wall or door or obstacle that you find in your path, you will get through it. It doesn't matter what you go through in life. Adversity is adversity. We all live in our own personal hell when we're going through adversity. In everything you do, once you decide that you're gonna be a leader, you should be a leader of your family. You should be a leader in the community. You should be a leader in your business. You should be a leader of yourself. I love this country. I love everything about it. It's up to all of us to preserve and nurture the future of our nation and to never forget the sacrifice of all those who have fought, bled, and died to make it what it is. And I truly believe it is that, that I overcome mindset that makes all the difference. And that is what that sign represents. And that unequivocally is how I have managed to keep myself moving forward and finding success. All right, good morning. Good morning, good morning. All right, all right. OK. All right, please. Please be seated. Down. Down. Good boy. Good morning. How are we today? Man, I am so blessed. I was so humbled that uh, Hank asked me to speak probably six months ago, thank goodness, because uh, I travel all the time, crazy schedule. So uh, it was nice to be able to put this on the calendar and to be able to do it. Uh, I speak all across the country to companies, sports teams, and Often when I give my message, or the majority of the time, it's a secular message. It's a me message delivered to companies and teams, things like that. But it's amazing to be able to give the full piece of the story, what you guys will be able to see. Uh, and, and it's pretty awesome to be able to do that. So I have a question. It's a very simple question. Who has problems? <laughs> Man, yeah, we all do. Life's hard. You know, all of us, it would be nice if life was like the movies and it was like this, you know, beautiful little yellow brick road where we go skipping off into the sunset, but it does not work that way. Life is hard. This physical world that we live in constantly has problems. Who has big problems? There's some of you in this room right now that are going through major adversity in your life, major problems. And it's interesting that sometimes when we start to witness these truly big problems, we wonder where God is in those moments. Because we think, well, Lord, I've got this big problem. Why have you not come along and fixed this? I've been asking you to fix this problem, and it hasn't happened. But you see, he's, he's got a, a bigger plan. And oftentimes, it doesn't happen on the timeline that we think it's going to. So speaking of big problems, I've got a big word that I want to throw out there to you. We're going to come back to this word, and that word is tribulation. Tribulation is a big word, and I'm going to, I'm going to give you the definition according to the dictionary. It is, a, it is a state of great trouble 
or suffering. And I thought it was interesting, I wrote down the synonyms to the word tribulation. Suffering, distress, trouble, misery, wretchedness, unhappiness, sadness, heartache, woe, grief, sorrow, pain, anguish, agony. How much does that describe the world we're living in right now? I watch the news and oftentimes I feel depressed. I watch it and I watch the, the murders and the rapes and the things that are happening in our community and it makes me sad. I've been all over the world. I've seen the depravity of man, the, the horrific, violent things that one man can do to another man or do to people. And it is summed up in that word tribulation. The life that we live, that we walk, the adversity that we face, it's easy for us to look at those things and say, these are the things that I'm going through. And it makes us start to ask, well, God, where are you? I called out to you. So the interesting thing is, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in the church. My dad was an elder in the church. And if the doors were open, we were there. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, any other night that it was open. If there was a meal, we made food, we were there. If there was something going on, we were there. So I grew up with what I like to call blind faith because I'd just been raised in this environment where I just accepted it as it was. Well, this is just the way it is. But as I grew up and got older and started to get more and more out in the world and became my own person, I started to think more. I started to analyze more. I started to question more. And as I walked along my journey of faith, I started to come along one question as I would read the Bible and see these things both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that question was, God, where are all the miracles today? You know, when Jesus walked the earth, he was doing miracles right and left, you know? Hey, I'm going to raise you from the dead. You're blind, fam. You can see. Oh, we got 5,000 people, and I've only got five loaves of bread. Pow! I got food for everybody. Miracles right and left. John 12, 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom Jesus raised from the dead. I mean... Could you imagine if you were walking along today and somebody was dead and they were like, get up, buddy. And he got up and walked away. I <laughs> mean, mind blown. So I started to ask those things. Where are all the miracles today, Lord, as I walk on my journey? You see, the other thing that I saw was the disciples that walked alongside Jesus and witnessed all these miracles and how their faith was both strong and at some point in the future was weak, and I'm going to come back to that. When I was 17 years old, I was still in high school. I joined the Navy, and I signed up to be a Navy SEAL. I went through SEAL training at the age of 18. I turned 19 when I got my trident, the seal emblem, and joined this warrior culture, still walking along this faith journey. And I joined this hard group of rugged individuals, some of the most elite warriors on the planet, and I convinced myself on this faith journey that there was no place for God in this warrior culture, at least not outwardly. I didn't want to profess my faith to my teammates because, you know, it wasn't cool. You know, I wanted to party and live like a rock star and do these hard warrior things. But I still believed. I became what I like to call a closet Christian. And in the hard times, in those times when I was afraid, and there were many times in my career I was afraid, I'd reach out to God. Hey, Lord, uh, you know, I'm getting ready to step out the back of this airplane at 10,000 feet with 100 pounds of gear at night. And yeah, my, I'm quaking in my boots right now. If you jump with me, that would be awesome. Thanks. <laughs> and then I'd get to the ground and I'd be like, "Woo, that was awesome. Let's go drink. So I pick and chose when I wanted to be a Christian. 
And I continued to walk down this journey of faith in the closet. And I stumbled across this paradigm, coming back to that question of where are all the miracles. You see, faith is a hard concept because it's not tangible. It's not like this bottle of water that I can pick up. I can open the cap. I can touch it. I can drink it. It can quench my thirst. I can hand it to a friend and say, if you're thirsty, take a drink of my water. It'll quench your thirst too. See, the problem with faith is it's intangible, and you have to truly believe and experience to realize that it too will quench your thirst. You just have to be willing to listen, to take it in. But see, I wasn't back then. So I would tempt God and say, you know, Lord, here's the thing. I want something tangible. So if you can show me a miracle, I've been wondering where all these miracles were. I want to see one. If you can show me something concrete, I will believe. Careful what you wish for. Because the reality was, I was like Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, also known as Doubting Thomas, for those that know him. You see, Thomas walked next to Jesus and witnessed all these miracles. And after Jesus was resurrected, several of the disciples told Jesus, told Thomas that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And Thomas refused to believe it. His exact words to them were, I won't believe it unless I can put my fingers in the holes of his hand and touch the hole in his side where that spear pierced him. John 20, 26, 28 says, And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Jesus cometh, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then he saith to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and see my hands, and reach hither thy hand and put it in my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. I was a doubting Thomas. And what I began to understand is faith is a journey. It is not something that happens overnight. It takes time for us to believe. But we have to still ourselves and look for those things. Faith takes commitment. It takes awareness. And it takes perspective of the world around us. See, the thing is, our foundations in faith, they're actually all around us, including miracles today. You just have to stop long enough and allow yourself to be aware of them. I've witnessed so many miracles. They happen all the time. How many of you have heard of someone that was sick with a life-threatening illness? And they went back to the doctor, and the doctor said, you're healed. I can't explain this. It defies all medical knowledge. That's a miracle. We talked about Lazarus being raised from the dead. There are individuals here that have come back from the dead. I have a good friend, Major Josh Montz. Josh was a U.S. Army officer working in Iraq in 2006 in Baghdad. They were on a patrol, and a sniper shot from across, the, uh, from across the city, and it struck Josh's squad leader, went through his squad leader, instantly killed his squad leader, the bullet exited, hit Josh in the leg, severed his femoral artery, and he dropped and bled out on the ground and died. They got him in a truck, they got him to the combat support hospital, and they started working on him. From the moment they got him in there, he was flatlined, no pulse. Medical professionals, usually six minutes is the time that they will work on somebody to try and bring them back. Because you see, after six minutes, the chances of not having brain damage is high. Ten minutes is kind of the next stop point. And the chances of not having brain damage is astronomical at this point. They kept working on him. For whatever reason, this medical team refused to stop working on Josh. At 15 minutes, which 
any doctor walking this planet would tell you that 15 minutes without a pulse and oxygen in your brain, there is no chance of you surviving without having major signs of brain damage, major signs of problems. Beep, they got a pulse. They brought Josh back. Today, Josh is a walking miracle. There's nothing wrong with him. He wrote an amazing book called The Beauty of a Darker Soul about going through the adversity and tribulation that we experience, and he's getting out there and telling that story. He's a miracle. That's a modern-day miracle. I have another friend, Tim Brown, firefighter. Tim was there on 9-11. He was right there in the tower working with the headquarters element in this chaotic and crazy environment. All these individuals who had been wounded and injured from the plane crash were coming down, and they were piling up in the lobby. And one of the fire chiefs told Tim, Tim, we got to get some more paramedics in here. We've got to move these people out there, clogging the stairwell to get people out. Tim ran out of the building, ran across the street, found some more paramedics, and said, hey, come with me. He was literally running back into the building. He was about 20 yards from the door when the tower started to collapse. Huge chunks of steel and debris were raining down on him, and he and the two paramedics ran into Tower 4. Now, back in 1993, Ramsey Yusuf blew up a bomb in the basement of Tower 4, created a lot of destruction. When they rebuilt that tower, they totally reinforced that side of the building. Experts predict that within a, uh, a certain area around the World Trade Center, there was almost a 100% kill rate where those towers fell. One of the few survivors happened to be in that area, Tower 4. There were about 60 people that survived. My friend Tim Brown was one of them. That's a miracle. I am a walking miracle. 11 years ago, I was leading a team of SEALs on a mission in Iraq, and we got into a big firefight, and I got all shot up. Rounds in my body armor, two rounds in my arm that I thought had taken my arm off, rounds off my side plate, rounds off my helmet, left night vision tube shot off, I took rounds off my gun, and I took a round in the face, caught me from behind, it blew out my right cheekbone, it shattered all the bones above my, it vaporized my orbital floor, my eye dropped into the hole in my face, it took off my nose, it shattered my jaw to my chin, and it knocked me out. And I lay on the ground in front of my teammates who were fighting for our lives behind me with the only point of cover they had, a large tractor tire. And as I lay there flat on my back when I came to watching rounds travel over me, I realized I was dying. There is a physiological process that occurs when you die, when you are losing blood. This body God built is a machine, and it operates off certain pressures. And when those pressures spring a leak, you don't operate as well anymore. And we need oxygen to our brain and to our heart to function properly. And I was going through this process as my blood was leaking out onto the ground. And I got weaker. And I got to the point where I could no longer move a muscle. I remember I tried to move my right hand, and I could not move it. Every breath I took got harder and harder to take a breath. And it was at that point I realized I was going to die right there on that spot. And I thought about my wife. I thought about my kids. I thought about that I would not have another Christmas with them. I thought about that I wouldn't raise my son to be a strong young man. I would never walk my daughters down the aisle. And I thought about the regrets that I had. And once again, in that time of fear and hardship, I called out to God. And I said, Lord, please, please give me the strength to go home. Like that, I had energy. To this day, I don't know how long that was. I estimate 10 to 15 minutes between the time I made that prayer to the time the medevac helicopter came in. It landed about 70 yards from me. I went from not being able to move a muscle that when that helicopter came in, 
I got to my feet and I literally walked to that helicopter and I got on under my own power. I am a walking miracle. I'd ask God to show me something tangible to prove he's out there and he gave it to me. So be careful what you wish for. The problem with modern day miracles is in this secular society we live in, people want to discount them. Well, that's just coincidence. That's just fate. Oh, you were just lucky. I have a good friend, a fellow SEAL who is an atheist. And about two years after I was wounded, I told him that story. And he was like, yeah, just luck. I felt the power when I made that prayer. I can't even explain to you how to have no energy whatsoever to not be able to move a muscle, to not be able to take a full breath, to be gasping for air, and to suddenly get up and just have this energy. There's no luck, coincidence, or fate that could have built that. We just have to stop and look around us to see these things because they're all around us. I wanted to see these concrete things, these concrete things that, you know, are without question. I wanted to see a story like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego delivered from the fiery furnace. Daniel 3, 24 and 25, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. I mean, that is a... I wanted something like that. Yeah, fast forward. I was delivered from the furnace that night myself. Now here's where I want to confess. You would think, you would think that after what I've been through, the miracles I've witnessed, the friends that I have, that I would have this rock-solid faith, that I would never question anything related to my faith, Christianity. But I still sometimes have doubts because faith is intangible. In those hardest times, sometimes we don't see why things are going the way they are because we start to think about us and not about the bigger picture that we cannot see, that only God can see. And it's in those moments that we waver. Faith is not absolute. We are human, and it will waver at times. Like doubting Thomas, witnessed all these miracles, walked with Jesus, and did not believe when Jesus told him he was coming back. And Thomas had witnessed all this. He didn't believe it. Or Peter, one of Jesus' most beloved disciples, And Jesus told him, you are going to deny you know me. Not just once, but three times after I'm gone. Self-preservation got the best of Peter. Matthew 26, 75. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and he wept bitterly. We're human. We are flawed. It is the reason Jesus was sent to die on that cross for us. And that's why it's okay. It's okay to have these moments of doubt. I have had them. Small faith can make all the difference. Faith is a journey, a journey that we take step by step. You don't go out and run a marathon, 26.2 miles, if you have not been running and getting ready for it. You run small distances to get ready for the big race. And faith is no different. Matthew 17, 20. And he saith unto them, because of your little faith. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible to you. Man, faith of a mustard seed. Most of us don't. 
Most of us struggle with our faith. So build that faith journey. Build those facts. Be around the people that can help it grow. Place your problems and your faith in God. And not just in the scariest or the hardest times. Do it all the time. The little prayers. Thanking Him for the things that He's given us. Even for the problems that He's presented to us. A lot of people, a part of my story is I once made some big leadership failures as a young leader in the Navy. It almost kicked me out of the Navy. I had to humble myself. I write about it in my book. And a lot of people ask me, man, you being wounded and all shot up and four years and 40 surgeries to be put back together, that's probably the hardest thing you've ever been through. Nope. Failing as a leader and having to endure building my reputation back up was the hardest thing I've ever been through. And when I look back on being wounded, we wonder why God does things that he does. He absolutely prepared me for being wounded. We never know why things happen. Embrace them. I got a second chance. As a matter of fact, we all did. It's the reason he came down and died on that cross and walked this earth. But once again, when we talk about life is hard, we all got problems. Things are not going to go right. Small pieces of faith will make that difference in the long run. We live in a world now, coming back to that big word, of tribulation. I have built my life since I've been injured around this one word, overcome. I talk all across the country about the overcome mindset. But you see, the thing is, what I have overcome is physical and it's mental. And I can teach people how to build themselves in those areas. But Jesus has overcome spiritual things. He overcame death and sin for all of us. When I was getting ready for this, I asked the Lord to to give me a verse to capture the message that I was trying to give. And he led me to this verse. And I've never read this verse before in my life. And it was so powerful, it it literally brought me to tears when I read it. It said, These things have I spoken to you, that in me ye may have peace. In the world ye have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. The greatest miracle that's ever existed on the planet. It is recorded in history, not just in the Bible, but in Roman historical documents and other documents that Jesus walked this earth and came back. What problem do you have that cannot be overcome knowing that the one overcame the world? So build confidence in your faith, as small as a mustard seed, so that God can overcome all your problems. Thank you. Praise God.